32 billion active users every month. And we, the users, spend an average of 2.5 hours per day scrolling on our screens. Social media have revolutionized our society and our daily lives. For some aspects, it did so for the good, allowing us to stay in touch with our friends, helping us find jobs, or simply having access to information. Social media also created room for free speech, for dissidents and whistleblowers. This is why authoritarian regimes like China or Belarus do not like them and even banned them. But there is also the flip side of the coin. As more and more people rely on social media as their main news source, the more likely they are to believe this information. We now know these powerful online platforms are used for spreading fake news, hate speech, harassment and conspiracy theories. During the pandemic, we experienced online disinformation campaigns on an unprecedented scale aimed at undermining confidence in Western-produced vaccines or making us believe that China or Russia manage the pandemic better than the EU. Even worse, as we saw in so many elections, to mention just the Brexit referendum, foreign actors used online platforms to interfere and undermine our democratic process and democracies. But it was probably the Capitol Hill riots in January 2021 that served as a wake-up call. It's on pro-Trump Facebook groups that the mob got organized to ravage the temple of American democracy. And it's on Twitter that Trump himself motivated his supporters, repeating his baseless claim that the election had been stolen. We're gonna walk down and I'll be there with you. Trump's Facebook and Twitter accounts were finally blocked or suspended by the platforms. But is it up to the powerful big tech owners to take such decisions? Today, in Europe, we have almost no tool to prevent harmful activity taking place on these platforms. For the socialists and democrats, self-regulation is not enough. We need laws, not guidelines, to increase platforms' accountability, while safeguarding freedom of speech and avoiding censorship. No amount of people that we can hire will be enough to review all of the content. We need more transparency and clear rules about taking down illegal content, including hate speech and incitement to violence. And we need to fix the algorithms that promote polarization at the expense of constructive dialogue. We need to end the digital wild west and protect our democracies. Buongiorno, buongiorno a tutte, buongiorno a tutti. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for attending the meeting this afternoon. It's a real pleasure for me to welcome you. Welcome people who are here in the flesh and those who are here remotely. And you've just had a look at the video prepared by the PES group, which fits in very nicely with the work that we're doing. Dealing partly with the work of the committee that we, the INGE committee that we are, many of us here are a part of, dealing with external interference in European democratic processes. We've already looked at this issue there was a similar type of initiative, similar to today's. European Democracies Not For Sale, it was called. And back then, we looked at the question of the, question, the battle against interference in general, and question, also the question of the skewer links, the shady links between people in the European Union and actors outside. Now, as part of the Inga committee we're going a step further and we're looking at a particularly significant and sensitive issue with various guests I'd like to thank them first of all for being here we are looking at social platforms disinformation and democracy and we'll begin with a video presentation from the head of our group Irache Garcia Perez so I'll give her the floor immediately. January 2021 that served as a wake-up call. It's on pro-Trump Facebook groups that the mob got organized to ravage the temple. 
And thank you for the invitation to open this event that touched on one of the major challenges of the digital transition, as well as the future of our democracies. Technology has made all our life easier and has brought people together in a way that was uh, unthinkable only a few years ago. Even more so during the pandemic, where technology made it possible to continue working and also to keep in touch uh, with our loved ones. We all got used to using video calls, social media platforms and other tools. Yet the growth of social media brings uh, with a huge challenges. Disinformation and manipulation are threatening our democracy and unless we act, citizens cannot have confidence that they see online in the true picture. The S&D group has for a very long time called for action, already before the pandemic. We demanded social media platforms to take responsibility in the fight against the spread of lies and attacks of the European values and democracies. The waves of disinformation following the COVID-19 crisis are yet another stark reminder of the potential danger in this new virtual landscape. We have all seen the spread of lies about the virus or about the policies against it. These disinformation campaigns also confirm that there are foreign actors uh, that uh, want to undermine the European Union with their propaganda, fear and conspiracy theories. This not only harms or our values, but it can also affect lives when we are talking about health. China and Russia have used the pandemic to create division in Europe, sowing doubts about the EU handling of the crisis and deflecting attention from their own struggles with the pandemic. Social media companies have a responsibility to promote credible news, sources and information. But this is not enough. We also need more transparency about how they display content. Many platforms only want to increase the profit. Governments must also do more to improve media literacy and back new rules to protect citizens' privacy online. The e-privacy regulation, for example, is essential to ensure that citizens are not tricked and targeted by these companies. In addition, the high market concentration of a few companies comes uh, with a strong power imbalance. We need to address this also via competition policy in order to create a more pluralist landscape. I hope that the ongoing work on the Digital Service Act can find solution at least to some of these challenges. Solution that on the one hand protect fundamental rights, but also effectively combat the spread of disinformation disestablishing our democracies. I am glad to see our Sandy rapporteur on the DSA here today among also other experts participants and I am sure that many ways forward will be discussed. I look forward to hearing the proposal and I wish you a very fruitful debate. Thank you. <laughs> Well, Iraqi was extremely clear and they provide, I think, an excellent introduction to this afternoon's meeting. Well, I now turn to the chair of the INGA committee, Rafael Glucksmann, who is going to help us get into the nitty gritty of the debate, telling us about what's happening in the committee of the parliament in general. Rafael. Thank you very much, Francesco. Thank you very much for organizing this uh, cooperation conference within the group. Now, as you know from the very beginning, the Inge Committee has been aiming to end naivety, the fact that the European pu public is naive in terms of the threat of social media. Social media is, in fact, calling into question democratic processes in our countries. We political parties are often victims of political attack, but we're also naive about social, media's, uh, social media platforms. It's true that these platforms 
are a potential major advance in terms of democracy. However, but they also help autocratic regimes that are trying to spread their authoritarian control. This is the dark side of social media and that's what we're looking at today. Since the very first uh, uh, meeting of the Special Committee on Foreign Interference, we have been very alert. We have been alert to the fact that uh, journalists, researchers, policy makers have been uh, telling us that these platforms are also the platform, they are a place for public debate, but they also uh, are, they severely influence our public debate due to hostile foreign influence. Uh, the current system. We have a European code of good conduct in terms of information, but this code leaves too large room for maneuver for social media platforms in terms of fighting against disinformation. Of course, these platforms are absolutely essential in our democratic debates and public space. However, all of us have to play our part. We as legislators need to create legislation to ensure that platforms and all other democratic actors have some binding rules that curtail their activity and uh, actually regulate it. It's very important also to push platforms to ensure that they prevent uh, um, disinformation and the misuse of their own softwares. The strategic approach is not just about uh, counteracting Russia or China, but it's in fact about uh, uh, leading to polarization as well as dividing our societies. Algorithms also lead to further uh, polarization and they prey on emotion rather than facts. We have systemic issues like bots, deep fake and uh, trolls that help f hostile foreign influences to only increase their influence through social media platforms and actually kill the trust of our citizens in our democratic institutions. On the Digital Services Act, uh, work has been ongoing for many years and we hope that that uh, work will only continue. The European Parliament nonetheless is called on to react and I'm sure and I hope that we will be able to provide these necessary responses. We have to protect our democracy and to do this we also have to ensure equal protection to for all uh, citizens of the European Union irrespective of uh, residence or language used. We have to also issue sanctions to data providers and data holders abroad. We have to look at the software as well as the platforms used. And we also have to recognize the immense work done by media outlets as well as civil society where they create a mapping of the situation as well as to come up with uh, national codes as well as guidelines for online use. We also have to talk about awareness raising within the media. The freedom of expression is absolutely key. It's a fundamental right. Uh, however, there can be no freedom without rules and, there, and without uh, public uh, participation. Th the panel today chaired by Francesco will allow us to get a better area of what we need to do to ensure this freedom but with correct rules in a way that we don't kill democracy, but in fact, we make a democracy more lively and more vibrant. So before this, uh, we kick off this panel, I would like to welcome the Vice President of the European Commission in charge of data and transparency, who is also in charge of uh, the code of good conduct. Uh, we have Ms. Jourova uh, of the Commission with us here today. Thank you very much, Madam, for being here today and for sharing with us your analysis of the state of play. You have been an ally on the Foreign Interference Committee from the very beginning and you are someone who is uh, has definitely exited this naivety that I was talking about and you're definitely an important watchdog there. So it's an uh, absolute pleasure to have you. Now, Madam, the floor is yours.
Uh, I want to start by thanking you for organizing this event in the European Parliament. And let me also confirm that uh, uh, in INGE committee and in, in your Mr. Glicksbert personally and, and the other honorable members, I see uh, allies uh, who uh, were with me from the beginning, even before we adopted uh, the pieces of legislation relating to the digital space. It was very valuable to, to ha have a chance uh, to, to consult. Uh, for instance, how far to go? Because indeed we speak here about the fact that uh, European Union started to regulate the space which you already showed in the in the video and which Madame Garcia Perez spoke about and you, Mr. Glockelixman, uh, all those uh, risky developments which we see stemming from digital space uh, having spillover effect on the real world, uh, uh, all all those things should be uh, should be regulated and uh, it should be done without. Uh, uh, reducing the freedom of speech and fundamental rights. So what we want in Europe to have technologies uh, which will serve the people, not vice versa. We want the technologies uh, which will not manipulate, which will not increase uncertainty, insecurity, which will not decrease our freedoms. Uh, that's why we need to cultivate the digital space. And I think uh, what, what you also said before, uh, uh, we need laws, not guidelines. So uh, I think that this is this is proper moment to discuss how the laws should look like because we are at the beginning of the legislative process. Uh, I do not belong to those who are uh, always bashing the, the digital players and, and big tech for all, all the negative things. We also see a lot of positive things. We uh, saw uh, the uh, great opportunity during the Arab Spring when people were able to organize themselves and share information independently from the control of authoritarian rules. Uh, and uh, or the example of the Maidan protests in, in uh, Kiev or uh, recently in Belarus, people use encrypted apps to organize protests. So we also have to see this, this part uh, of, of the, or this side of the same coin. But uh, by working on this agenda, I noticed one thing, that the real world is still better than what we see in the digital mirror. And I think it's because in the real world we still have a reliable body of law which has been developing over decades or even centuries, uh, which cultivates our uh, life and, and our society. And this is missing in online world. That's why we need to push the rules there as well, uh, because if we do not do that, uh, I have a feeling that the, the jungle in, in digital sphere will uh, uh, become the jungle in our real life. So you see the interaction, uh, which might be very dangerous. Uh, so now to cover the risks. Uh, uh, I will emphasize especially the risk for our electoral uh, processes and campaigns. Uh, and it was also mentioned most prominently with foreign and organized actors manipulating the information flows. They have great tools like an army of undetected bots exploiting the vulnerabilities in platforms' algorithmic systems. And this is not and should not be the de debate about true versus false information. As I said before, freedom of speech is non-negotiable. Uh, and I am uh, repeating that again and again as somebody who lived half of my life in a communist regime when we were uh, living under one official doctrine. This must not happen in Europe. It must not happen uh, uh, due to some uh, crazy political uh, developments and it must not happen by means of uh, develop, developing business because this could be also the way which, uh, through which we could appear in the, in the world with one uh, official doctrine. So, uh, no way for Europe. 
we try to focus in commission on maximizing benefits of digital sphere and uh, opportunities and reducing risks and this is why we are shaping new digital rules with groundbreaking legislation like digital services act digital markets act and an uh, artificial intelligence act and we also are going beyond legislation with the European Democracy Action Plan, where we are outlining the, the way how we want to minimize the impact of disinformation. Uh, this is not uh, updating of the legislation, uh, because we are the first ones coming with fresh new uh, legislation. We have no one to follow in the world. Uh, and uh, we know that we have to do it uh, right for, for the first time. So that's why the cooperation uh, in, in the legislative process with the parliament and with the member states will be key to find uh, the, the proper way. And I believe that the commission proposed something which is very well thought through and, and balanced. And uh, especially something which uh, uh, has inside of it uh, the principle of human-centered uh, technology uh, idea that, that we, should, uh, we should be able to uh, promote technologies, but always to have in mind the individual people and their rights. With the Digital Services Act, we have placed the rule of law and due process at the center of the intervention. We clarify through accountable legal norms what precise responsibilities online intermediaries have, both in tackling illegal content and protecting freedom of expression online. Let me just remind us of what, what we deem illegal in, in European uh, legal framework. It's, it's hate speech, it's terrorism, extremism, and it's uh, uh, child pornography and child abusive material. So this is prohibited content. For offline world, well, it has to be respected online. And that's why we are increasing the responsibility of the platforms to proactively uh, work against these, these kind of contents. Uh, the Digital Services Act is a horizontal legislation. Uh, and uh, this is crucial. All citizens in the EU should have the same rights online and be equally protected. And I am happy to have been able to discuss recently the proposal with uh, the rapporteur, Madame Charles de Mose, and, and she knows that I'm looking forward to continued dialogue. For certain sensitive areas, uh, the Digital Services uh, Act does not uh, go far enough and we need special rules. And this is why we came with measures on disinformation that I would mention in a minute and why I will propose a new legislation on transparency of political advertising. In other words, we have carved out these matters of the General Digital Services Act, and we are now working on, on special legislation. Uh, why? Because too much is at stake here, and we need to have well-targeted rules. We uh, want elections to be the competition of real people, of, of the visions, uh, of ideas uh, and not a competition of dirty methods, uh, which we saw, for instance, with Cambridge Analytica scandal. So uh, this is one thing. Also, uh, the Digital Services Act is, is focusing on the commercial side of uh, sharing information and of, of this is the advertising industry we are uh, entering in and where we want to bring more fairness. Uh, especially for co commercial uh, exchanges. But, but here we are not in commercial world. We are not in the world of consumers only. We are also in the world of citizens, uh, where I believe that uh, the citizens and their uh, chance to take part in free and fair elections without manipulation, this is something which should be protected str with stronger rule than uh, what we see in the uh, Digital Services Act. We will come with the legislation by the end of, of this year. Now shortly on the code of, dis of conduct against disinformation, uh, you said at the beginning that the uh, voluntary actions or guidelines should be come to an end, then that we need laws. Uh, I fully subscribe to this idea. 
uh, we have to continue this self-regulatory uh, method till the Digital Services Act will come into force. And that's why we decided to upgrade the code of practice against uh, disinformation. Uh, uh, why uh, it needs uh, some corrections or some, some improvements. Uh, two examples. We are still seeing too much advertising revenue going to the purveyors of disinformation and researchers and public authorities still lack sufficient access to data to study the spread of disinformation, social media and assess the effectiveness of their countermeasures. In other words, we have a lot of data about the results, how many uh, fake accounts have been taken down and so on, but we do not have data to be able to, to, to measure, the, uh, to assess the impact of the code. And this is important to understand that what we are doing, uh, the, the way and direction we are pushing the platforms to go, to, to continue, uh, bears fruits and either or not, and then to take additional political decisions. We need to know uh, more about, about the real impact. Uh, what we are changing in the new code uh, or recommending to change because the code belongs to the signatories who should adapt to our guidelines by the end of this year. So I hope the new code will start working from January next year. Uh, the platforms and other players in the advertising ecosystem should step up efforts and work together to defund this information incentivized through the online advertising system. In other words, what we propose in the new code is uh, cut them of the money, starve them out. Do not feed the disinformers with advertisers' money. That's, I think, a very clear message. Uh, the revised code should also strengthen commitments to limit manipulative behavior, provide user empowerment tools, increase the transparency of political advertising and also empower the research and fact-checking community. In other words, I have to translate this into normal language, <laughs> not to use this jargon only. Uh, we want the platforms to outsource the cleaning service. Uh, to invite the society, to invite the citizens to notify the disinformation so that it is verified whether it's a it's, it's, uh, fact, fact or not. Not opinions, just the facts. And we need to have a uh, much bigger number of fact checkers and, and professional journalists uh, checking the facts. And to be paid. This cannot be just a voluntary uh, charity work because, again, too much is at stake. So that's the, I know I'm, I'm using two tough words, uh, cleaning service, but we really try to invite the society and to, in, to attract them to, to work on, on a cleaner and more trustworthy internet. We do not want to introduce or establish uh, one or two places which will be the arbiters of the truth. And I think this is the core idea behind the code of practice. I know I speak too long, uh, but uh, I wanted to, uh, to uh, ex explain well what we are proposing in the, in the code. We believe that the signatories will uh, uh, invest efforts in uh, upgrading their uh, actions according to the code. We want to invite more signatories, especially the advertising industry. Uh, and this is going to, to happen over the, the rest of this year so that the new code starts working uh, uh, from the beginning of the next year. Last few words about uh, external influence, which also is going to be debated uh, uh, by, by you. Uh, notably, pro-Kremlin sources have spread false and misleading information about Western vaccines, as well as about the status of the Sputnik V vaccine in the process of the European Medicine Agency ap application and review. I am mentioning that, that already before COVID, we saw very intensive uh, uh, permanent attack from uh, Russian sources on, on Europe uh, on different topics. But with COVID-19, these two topics 
uh, started to be dominating and, and the disinformation was spread uh, all over Europe. Uh, I was the first one who said openly that Russia is the main producer of disinformation against, against Europe. And this is, I think, the reason why I appeared on the Russian sanction list. And I am proud of it because somebody should have said it. And so also it was necessary to uh, speed up the actions. Now the External Action Service and Joseph Borrell uh, are working also together with us on the possible sanctions for this external attacking uh, or attacking Europe from external uh, 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 powers or forces. And we, of course, also on this work on external um, uh, influence uh, very much uh, rely on uh, the uh, INGE committee, INGE special committee, that uh, we can work together uh, on, on doing or uh, preparing stronger reaction of, of Europe against all these uh, very negative trends. So thank you very much. I skipped some of the parts <laughs> which were prepared for you, but I just wanted to uh, emphasize the, 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 the main ideas which are behind our, our proposals. And again, I am looking forward to further cooperation with, with the special committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Vice President. Uh, I know that uh, we share the uh, same kind of honor, you and me, because uh, we have bon be both been sanctioned by uh, authoritarian regimes, uh, you by Russian regime and me by uh, the Chinese regime, which might mean that uh, we are working to defend our democracies in an efficient manner. Uh, and thank you for the uh, underlying uh, underlining that uh, the Im impact of the virtual world is, is, is not virtual and that we need, as you said, a good cleaning service. So maybe today we will learn more about what is this cleaning service. And, and also for underlining that freedom of speech is key, but that freedom, in order to be preserved, needs rules. And that these rules need to come from public authorities, from us, not from private entities. Uh, so I'm uh, giving you the floor again, uh, Pier Francesco, thanking you once again for organizing this uh, exciting event and uh, looking forward to hearing uh, to our panelists. Grazie ancora, Rafael. Thank you, Rafael. I've not been sanctioned by any regime yet, but I do have to say that I totally agree with what you said and what Vice President Jourova had to say as well. And I think that her contribution once again clarified matters. And they're showing that the European institutions are now taking this crucial issue seriously. There's really been a leap forward. There's now European commitment at an institutional level which is far more significant than it was before. And our special committee as Raphael Glucksmann has reminded us, is committed to this issue as well, looking constantly at this very, very topical issue. But now let's get into the nuts and bolts of the roles of platforms, the way they work, their business plans. And we've got a panel, a panel which will have various contributors. And what we want to do with the panel is not just to demonize platforms, rather what we want to do is clarify the institutional position. Make it clear that things have changed, if I can put it that way, and listen to voices, how we can listen to voices which might differ one from another. And it goes without saying, of course, that platforms are now part and parcel of our societies, our democracies, our very lives. They're a tremendous instrument to get people close together, even if they're physically very far apart. They've come up with all sorts of fantastic content, but of course that's not all they are. And whether they plan it like that way or not, uh, they are often the instrument to use to promote 
hate speech, disinformation, dissemination, and promoting principles and content that is highly dangerous and needs to be counteracted. So what we need to do first and foremost, I think, is to understand how we can put together more effective instruments to combat these misuse of platforms. And the misuse of platforms and the spread and proliferation of fake news is not and cannot be an excuse for institutions not to do anything. We need to realize that this doesn't mean we don't have to look at things like inequality, problems with health systems, which is particularly relevant now, of course, economic inequalities. And we can't use fake news as an excuse to ignore the problems with our democracies. That's a point that I think is absolutely clear. I want to, however, state it again to make certain that everyone hears me. The political actions of the European institutions are not perfect. It's not that they were absolutely brilliant and these platforms and fake news have simply painted a distorted picture of everything. That's not the system. That's not what's happening. But the point is that we need to defend our democratic, democratic systems by not allowing platforms to start promoting distorted visions, but to use the platforms as a way of building community. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about in this panel, where I am the moderator. We've got Crystal Schaldemosa, who's been mentioned already this afternoon, and we'll be talking about issues that have already been referred to by the Commission, and it's relevant to what we're working on and we've also got Aura Sala and Yael Eisenstadt. And it's the last one, Yael Eisenstadt, we'll be talking, hearing from first. She's from the Future of Democracy, she's a Future of Democracy Fellow from the Bear Gruen Institute. It's a great pleasure to see you this afternoon. And please, I'd like you to contribute to what we've got to say, contribute to our issue, and look at the title of this panel Platforms social platforms, business models and disinformation, how they contribute to disinformation and what we can do to change the game. So I'll give you the floor, Yael Eisenstadt. Hi, thank you so much. I truly appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation today. So my comments today will mostly focus on Facebook for two reasons. First, because I worked there. And second, because I do believe that of all the social media companies, Facebook is the most powerful and has been the most negligent in the space of fixing some of the ways the company has helped spread disinformation and distrust. So, on the question of business models. I'm happy to see you focusing on the business model. Content moderation, while incredibly important and complicated, alone will never fix this we must get to the questions about the systemic issues that make the platform ripe for disinformation, conspiracy theories, radicalization, and hate to begin with. I and others have argued for years that a business model predicated on inferring as much as they can about who we are by tracking our data on and off their platforms to sell targeting tools to advertisers is dangerous for democracy. Facebook's bottom line depends on provoking strong emotions to keep us engaged, often incentivizing inflammatory, polarizing voices. Whether that is intentional is besides the point. It is what's happening. As their own algorithms have learned, the unfortunate reality is lies are more engaging online than truth. And salaciousness beats out fact-based reasoning in a world optimized for frictionless virality. As long as algorithms' goals are to keep us engaged, they will feed us the poison that plays to our worst instincts and human weaknesses. Again, I'm not saying this is Facebook's goal, but it is what their platform has been demonstrated again and again to be doing. 
And while none of that is currently illegal, I think most of us can agree that it is not serving democracy well. Now, Facebook would rather have us steer the conversation to be about content moderation, what to take up and what to leave down. Any arguments about the harms this business model have caused have been vehemently denied by companies like Facebook, most recently by Nick Clegg, who I was sincerely hoping would accept the invitation to attend today and engage in a difficult conversation directly with critics such as myself. But rather than taking any more time arguing yet again about the detrimental effects of this mo business model, I prefer to focus today on the second part of the question, has Facebook done enough to combat disinformation? Facebook leadership has made an intentional business decision again and again to protect those in power, not just in the US, but around the world, often to the detriment of the public. While I spent most of my career focused on global issues, I have spent the past few years deeply involved in elections integrity issues in the United States. But I believe the U.S. example has valuable lessons for how Facebook makes decisions and how that will affect you here in Europe as well. In the run-up to the 2020 election, we all know that Donald Trump violated Facebook's policies over and over again. But he was given special treatment all the way from the top of Facebook leadership by refusing to fact check politicians while also providing them sophisticated tools to grow their audiences, make their content go viral without any friction, and target vulnerable populations, Facebook tilted the scales to push more people to believe in conspiracy theories about the election. And we saw the ultimate result of that negligence on January 6. I am not saying that social media bears the sole responsibility for the state we are in today. But Facebook's response that they're just a mirror to society is a convenient attempt to deflect any responsibility for how the platform amplified harmful content, allowed elite voices to intentionally undermine an election, helped facilitate hate groups organizing and planning on their platform, and even worse, for how their own tools helped hate groups recruit, connected people who met in real life and committed crimes, and even auto-generated hate groups. Facebook could, if they wanted to, fix some of it. Let's look at this U.S. example. In the run-up to the 2020 elections, they could have stopped amplifying and recommending the conspiracy theorists, the hate groups, purveyors of disinformation, and in some cases, even the president. In fact, that's exactly what I and so many others were begging them to do, warning again and again what was coming. They could have stopped using the same personalization techniques to deliver, deliver political discourse that they used to sell us sneakers. They could have built in guardrails to stop certain content from going viral before being reviewed, and they could have done all of this without being what they call the arbiters of truth. But in the case of the Stop the Steal campaign and other disinformation campaigns about the election and ultimately calls to launch an insurrection, they chose not to. Their own employees have written internal letters to leadership pleading with them to stop letting political decisions trump their integrity efforts. Their own internal studies, as detailed by the Wall Street Journal, prove to Mark Zuckerberg that their algorithms facilitated polarization and pushed people into extremist groups. A number of former employees, myself included, have spoken up about what they saw at the company, despite Facebook's efforts to silence us with non-disparagement agreements attached to severance pay. So when I was at Facebook, the first thing I tried to, to tackle was disinformation and political advertising. And second, I tried to tackle voter suppression in particular in political ads. There was no appetite for either, and eventually I was pushed out. These should not have been controversial ideas. But in retrospect, they were policies that would have angered the incumbent at the time, and Facebook chose power preservation over protecting the integrity of our election. No, there is no easy, quick legislative solution that will create a healthy information ecosystem that helps democracy thrive. This will require looking at the entire ecosystem, but that does not mean the status quo can continue. The company intentionally scaled recklessly to dominate the entire global public square in large part due to a permissive legal environment in the United States but they do not want to bear responsibility as the stewards of those dem democratic spaces. So to wrap up, let me be crystal clear. I am not anti-tech. 
I would never have accepted to work at Facebook if I didn't want to help them do better. And I do actually believe Facebook has done amazing things in the world. I still use the platform. But none of that excuses them from the responsibility for the harms they have also caused. The bottom line is Facebook cannot be trusted to police itself. Until democratic governments demand real transparency and oversight over the company's tools, not necessarily over the actual speech, but over what the company chooses to do with that speech, then we will continue to be at their mercy. And yes, there are trade-offs for every possible solution. But the constant shouting about all the ways you will destroy the internet if the government ever steps in at all is being used to stifle any attempts to figure out how to create smart, whole of society solutions to foster a healthier information ecosystem. I know I'm out of time, but I look forward to discussing any of these comments in further detail. Thank you so much. Bene, grazie, grazie. Thank you, Ms. Eisenstadt. You were extremely clear and unambiguous in putting forward your views this afternoon. Thanks very much for your contribution. I do hope we'll have a chance to hear from her experts again towards the end. But now we turn to Aura Salla, head of the EU Facebook or EU Facebook office. So we've got the same questions really asked to you. What kind of options are being adopted by platforms, in particular Facebook, to try to deal with the disinformation type problem? And we're aware that platforms are all different. We're certainly not trying to put Facebook on trial. Let me be absolutely clear about that. But it is obvious that such a huge actor does have a big responsibility in a debate such as this one. So let me give you the floor now. Thank you so much and thank you for having me here today. Let me start by saying also to, to the previous speaker that as an EU affairs lead of the company, I'm here to engage and answer your questions that are topical in today's conversation. And I can say, say from my own experience now over one year in this company and coming from the EU institutions myself, that this company is ready to change and it is doing it every day. First, let me clarify. Uh, that at Facebook we differentiate between false or misleading content, which we consider misinformation, and organized malicious behavior or actors who share harmful content strategically. This we call disinformation, as we all know here. And uh, I will focus on latter, but let me first make it very clear that we as a company do not benefit from disinformation or misinformation on our platforms. The opposite. Our users or our advertisers don't want to see it, and we are doing our utmost best to keep our platforms clean and enjoyable for our users. Our business model is not built to create more engagement around this type of harmful information, and our systems are not designed to reward provocative or misleading content. In fact, Key parts of the, those systems, our systems are designed to do just the opposite. That is why we reduce distribution of many types of content because they are sensational, misleading, or are found to be false by, by our independent fact-checking partners. As a private company, we are serving our customers and users, and our community standards are clear what is okay to do on our platforms and what is not okay to do on our platforms. However, we think this is not enough. So I think we can agree here. Private companies like us should not be the ones deciding unilaterally what is right and what is wrong when it comes to content on social media platforms. That is why we have been asking from policymakers and democratically elected politicians a robust framework which helps protect people online protects democratic processes, while at the same time, time protects freedom of speech. 
However, we know that uh, implementing any legislation takes time. And that is why we are already acting. And we have just recently taken a strong stand on a number of hate speech and misinformation issues. I would like to highlight that it's important to separate deceptive content and deceptive behavior so, so we can be eff effective in solving these diff problems. We tackle the integrity of the information environment through addressing both misinformation and influence operations, which require different approaches. A major focus for Facebook is combating covert influence operations. That is strategic effort to manipulate or corrupt public uh, debate for a, a strategic goal. Often when people think about influence operations, they think about content. But we have learned over the years that content alone isn't strong signal to determine if a page or an account posting uh, is part of foreign or domestic interference campaign. Actually, our information operations threat report, we have released analyses over 150 coordinated inauthentic behavior operations we have found since 2017. In it, we pull uh, global security trends and offer recommendations on how to counter these threats in the future. This provides really unique insights into our efforts to tackle influence operations derived from four years of investigative and uh, enforcement work, during which we have worked to build a collective response and develop policies, automated detection tools and enforcement frameworks to tackle deceptive actors. On the content side, Facebook effort to tackle misinformation continue to grow in, in very sophistic, uh, so, sophistication and effectiveness over time. Guided by our remove, reduce, inform strategy, over past year, for example, we have taken aggressive steps uh, to limit the spread of COVID-19 misinformation and connect people re with reliable information. And here I would like to thank many of health authorities in all 27 member states of the EU. We have had an excellent cooperation with the European Commission this far, and we were among the first signatories of the Code of Practice on Disinformation. The re review of the Code now is an opportunity to improve consistency of its uh, enforcement and monitoring while maintaining its uh, collaborative approach which um, already paved the way to strong cooperation between platforms and regulators. We also look forward to seeing the developing version of the Digital Services Act that is now in the hands of the EU co-legislators and concrete proposals of the European Democratic Action Plan we are expecting from the Commission later this year. Thank you so much and looking forward to uh, any questions. Bene, grazie a Davola Sala. Thank you, Mr. Sala. We'll be able to talk to you again in a short while, but I give the floor now to our MEP, Crystal Schaldemoser, who's the EP Rapporteur on the Digital Services Act from the Commission. And I'm sure it's got some very important things to say. And I think it's crucial that Parliament have autonomy when it puts together its point of view, trying to look at this interplay between the Commission, civil society and citizens. Go ahead, Madam. Thank you so much uh, also for organizing this uh, seminar today. I think it's really important, or webinar as it's called now, I think it's very important that we uh, give ourselves some time to discuss what's the best solution to tackle uh, the problems. Uh, uh, and, and let me be a little, you know, frank. When I listen to Facebook now, I think, well, apparently we don't have any problems. Everything goes well and, and Facebook is doing a lot of good things, so we apparently don't have to do anything. That's not how I see it. I, I, I believe that we have issues we need to tackle, and I also think that Facebook also needs to do more than they are doing uh, today, even though I do recognize that Facebook is trying to, to tackle some issues around misinformation. However, to the Parliament and to the DSA and what we can do, I don't think that there is one quick fix. Uh, we need to do a lot of different things to tackle uh, the, the challenges we're looking uh, into. Uh, I think that we need to look into the business models of the big platforms. 
uh, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, the business models of Facebook and others do have an impact on how disinformation and misinformation is spread. And therefore, I think it is important that we look into whether uh, you know, the harvesting of data in the way that, uh, that it takes place today is okay. And uh, here in the S&D group, we, we are discussing whether or not we should make a ban on this micro-targeting of advertisement. That, you know, it has this impact that, you know, the fact that you can, Facebook is profiling us uh, in order to sell ads um, uh, is, uh, is, is not a good business model and, uh, and, and it also creates some wrong incentives for companies. Uh, and therefore, one of the things I think we can do is consider the business model, look into whether we should ban this uh, micro-targeting of advertisement. But I'm also suggesting, in, in IMCO, I'm suggesting, you know, in the parliament, I cannot uh, suggest a ban because it's not in the competence of IMCO, but I expect other committees that will come up with that proposal. But what I'm suggesting is that we give consumers uh, bigger choices. So we, by default, have settings so that you're not micro-targeted from the beginning. If you want to have these ads, you can scale down the protection, but as a start, as a default, you need to, to have a, a high protection. And I'm also suggesting that uh, it should be transparent for companies where their money, when they buy ads on Facebook, where their money is used. I, 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 I expect that a lot of companies, if they knew where their uh, money went to what kind of sites on Facebook, uh, they would probably not uh, let the money go on, on, onto those sites. So I think that it's uh, on those pages. So I, I think the transparency on this is also important. So this is to look into the business model. I also think that we need to look into how the algorithm works. Uh, we have been talking about this. Uh, Mrs. Jourova also talked about this. And I think that uh, the Commission's proposal on DSA is a very good starting point. It, uh, asks by the platforms to make a risk assessment uh, on how the algorithm works. I think that we need to take it uh, some step further. I think it is important to make sure that uh, we um, not just make a, they not just make a risk assessment, but they also need to test how the algorithm works. Uh, and I think it is important that uh, they should be, they should not even be allowed to be designed in a way that lead to misinformation. Uh, so, so I think that we need or misinformation or dark patterns. Uh, so when we look into the recommender systems, that is a, a part of the algorithms, I think it is important that, that they, they, we kind of make, makes a kind of list of saying, this is an unfair commercial practice. We don't like this. We don't want you to do it. Uh, and one of the things is that we do, we, they should not be allowed to make uh, algorithms that works in a way that the users end up in dark patterns or in rabbit holes. I saw a couple of months ago uh, in the Danish news uh, about a lady from the United States. She was extremely sad because she felt that she ended up uh, not uh, on purpose uh, only seeing conspiracy theories uh, on Facebook. And she didn't know how she ended up there. She just had started to being a little bit interested in a little thing. And then suddenly everything she were recommended was about this. I think we need to do something about these kind of patterns. So that is what I'm trying to work with, uh, even though it is difficult. I also think that the platform should have a must carry obligation so that uh, uh, if somebody is trying to come up with disinformation, misinformation, for instance, misinformation on COVID-19 vaccine, uh, Facebook has already done something in this respect, but then th there should be then, you know, links so you can go to more uh, uh, public authorities to, ch to check into uh, information so that you are not just given this misinformation. Uh, so in many ways we can do a lot of things, uh, we should do a lot of things. We should also give the Euro European Commission some more competences so they have a chance to check the algorithms. We should give access to researchers uh, so they can look into the algorithms. That is already in the Commission's proposal, but I suggest that we also find a way to make sure that civil society organizations, maybe like Jarl Eisenstadt uh, and her organization, would have a chance to look into the algorithms as well. This might sound uh, too much, but it isn't. We see in many other places in society that civil society plays a role. The Dieselgate scandal was not uh, 
was not uh, revealed. Uh, we didn't found out of the Dieselgate scandal if it wasn't for a civil society organization in the United States. So I think that we need really to, to look into this. I will not speak more because we have to discuss it, but I'm just saying that we can do a lot of things. Business models, uh, consu consumer protections, uh, testing, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, testing and transparency, but also accountability on the algorithms and put up a list of what we don't allow uh, for uh, the algorithms in order to make sure that we create together a more safe uh, online environment um, in a way that, that can, be, can ben benefit our society and our democracy. And I hope that that's possible. I hope the DSA will help us in that direction, even though it's not the only tool. We need to do a lot of other things as well. Thank you very much. Grazie, Crystal. Grazie. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you for that. And also thanks for all the work that you're carrying out. Let me turn now to Yale Eisenstadt to see if she'd like to respond to what she's heard either from a Facebook point of view or what's just been said about the role of the institutions. I think it's important to do all we can to forge an alliance between institutions, private stakeholders, civil society and ordinary citizens to try to bring out the problem of the risks. We have to try to look at this every day but also work out countermeasures if we can. So let me ask Yale if she'd like to say anything about that and ask her and our other guests to say something but please keep it about five minutes ahead please. Thank you. Um, I actually really appreciate this conversation. Since leaving Facebook in 2018, I have not had a single Facebook person try to engage with me about these topics. It's usually been a one directional conversation from figures such as Nick Clegg. And I'm really, I want these conversations between platforms and the public because I have spent my life defending democracy. And again, I am not trying to shut down Facebook. I just want to help them do better. But I do have a few reactions to some of the statements made today. You know, I heard Ara, and I, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. I hope I am. Uh, make a similar statement that we've heard Nick Clegg make repeatedly, that it is not in Facebook's interest to show hateful content. And I understand that. Of course, it's not in Facebook's interest. And again, I'm not saying that it is intentionally favoring hateful content conspiracy theories and the like. But that also begs the question, if it's not in their interests, and yet it has been proven repeatedly that it is still happening, doesn't that in itself prove the point that Facebook cannot regulate itself? Um, also, you know, there's this point about Facebook not actually being built or its platform's business model not being predicated on engagement. And I would believe that, except it's still the metric that Facebook reports in their quarterly earnings report. They still report on growing daily active users and monthly active users, and they still grade their employees based on that, according to employees' own statements that have been in the press recently. So I do hope that they truly change that someday, but I just it doesn't seem to be bearing to be true. Now, one place that I will 100% agree with Ara is that they have stepped up after 2016 to combat foreign influence operations. I will argue they should have done it before 2016. Had they listened to outside experts, they would have, but I applaud the efforts they have taken in that, in that realm since. But here's the problem. Before the 2020 election in the United States, I and many others were saying again and again, again you are solving for the, for the crisis of 2016 and not for the problem of 2020, which has become domestic influence, influence operations. And I understand that is much more thorny and difficult to do when you don't want to anger the powers that have the potential to regulate you. It was politically complicated for Facebook, but let's be clear, they were negligent. Stop the Steal is just one of many examples where they were negligent on the domestic influence operations. I stand by my belief that Zuckerberg's no fact-checking politicians, a policy I personally bumped up against when I worked there, or this newsworthy exception that grew out of that, 
that those are two of the most dangerous things that happened in terms of democratic conversation, coupled with the tools and exemptions given to the powerful at the expense of the rest of us. These were all business decisions that harmed democracy. Now, all of the conversations about, com about content moderation, what to leave up, what to take down, what to check, fact check, what to label, they're incredibly important. But those are all reactionary conversations. None of that touches on the core of what I'm concerned with. The tools that these platforms are providing to help purveyors of disinformation thrive. It's like cleaning up the oil spill as opposed to putting in the proper security mechanisms in place to ensure that the oil spill doesn't happen to begin with. Personally, I've always argued that lawmakers need to focus on requiring transparency and regulatory oversight of these tools, such as the recommendation engines, the targeting tools, and algorithmic amplification, rather than a non-starter of regulating actually actual speech. I know I only have a few minutes, so I'm just going to wrap by saying Facebook has spent years arguing that they don't want to be the arbiters of truth. And I agree with them. I don't want them to be either. But they don't want to be the gatekeepers to information. They don't want to be held responsible for the harmful content, including disinformation on their platform. I think we can agree at this point that the situation as is is not sustainable. They can't just provide these targeting tools, these algorithms that help content go viral, these recommendation engines that push us all towards certain content and say they play no role and bear no responsibility for the breakdown in trust and in some cases have actually helped foment violence offline. I am very glad that they are calling on governments to regulate and that they appear more willing to cooperate I do wish, however, that they would engage more with outside critics who truly want to help ensure that they thrive, that free speech thrives, but that are calling for ways that whether or not detrimental to their bottom line can help foster a healthier information ecosystem. Again, this is the first time since I left Facebook in 2018 that I've shared a conversation with a Facebook employee, and I truly wish that would happen more often. Thank you. Grazie, grazie quindi per questo. Thanks very much. Thanks for that additional contribution. And we'll turn now to Aura Salla, who will address some of the points that have been made. Let me just add a question before I give Aura the floor. In uh, the Inga committee, various officials from uh, Facebook and other stakeholders from uh, platforms have said that the platform business model isn't simply related to the number of clicks and trying to get as many clicks as possible. So how much of Facebook's business management at the moment is used to gain data from users and then sell that on for commercial purposes. I'll be interested in learning that. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to start by saying that at least uh, this year that I have been in this company, our strategy is to be as much present, engaging and speaking publicly. And at least here in the EU and in Brussels, we do that. I think in two weeks I have participated to four or five panels. So we are here to engage. Second thing I would like to clarify, I think that also Mark Zuckerberg had made it very clear that we don't sell data. And if you know how our, how our uh, business model works, uh, I have been advertiser uh, on, on the platform uh, for last 10 years. And I can actually choose where I target, uh, target my ads. And uh, yes, transparency is a good thing, but at least as an advertiser, I'm quite well aware where I can find my audience and how these tools work. So I encourage everyone to go to see how the page advertisement actually works. And I would like to be very clear, we have also changed a lot 
since 2018. You know that nowadays we have a chronological news feed, so you can actually choose to see your friends and your families post there in, in right order so that algorithms are not choosing what you actually see. And let me emphasize one more time, Facebook systems are not designed to reward provocative content. Uh, uh, in fact, key parts of those systems are designed to do just the opposite, as I said. And we also changed our algorithms the way that you actually see your friends and families post first, because that's the content that people want to see. And that's the content uh, to next to our, our uh, advertisers want to place their ads. For example, we reduced these clickbait um, headlines that are misleading or, or ex exaggerating, highly sens sensational health claims, for example, uh, those promoting miracle cure. And also I would like to tell the honorable uh, rapporteur here that actually uh, we are not only reducing mis information when it comes to COVID-19 in all member states. We have teamed up with the healthcare authorities here in the EU with the European Commission. And when you go to your Facebook, you can actually find uh, facts on COVID-19 in your own language. So that's definitely part of our strategy that we don't only reduce, we also uh, forward people to go uh, go to see the right, right, right information and facts from healthcare authorities. So uh, our advertising model, which is often criticized for uh, supposedly incentivizing bad content in order to hook people and get them to spend more time on the platform, platform often pulls into other direction. Our advertisers simply don't want their products and services advertised next to the extreme or polarizing content or misleading content, not on COVID-19 or anything else. So we have every incentive to reduce it, and that's what we are actually doing right now. But we fully agree with you that this should not only be the efforts of private companies like ourselves, and that's why we are here to engage and hear from you. And also we are waiting to see the results of these uh, long legislative processes from the EU. Thanks very much. I think it is important that we hear different voices, both in a webinar like this, but also make certain that the institutions realize that they're not dealing with people who are all aware that they're doing something that has an impact on the real world. We've got obviously what I'm saying here goes for various platforms. They do have an impact on public life and fall, come into the life of ordinary citizens. And so it's only natural that we ask them to take some responsibility for what they do. Crystal Sheldamosa said something in the past, and she said that the time has come to take back the control that the platforms have and give it back to society with appropriate democratic supervision. And this idea of democratic supervision is something which I wanted to restate. And I'll give Crystal the floor to end this section of the panel. Thank you so much. Yes, it's true that I have said that I think the time has come for us to take back control. As we saw in the beginning with the video, uh, uh, you know, the platforms, they do uh, give us a lot of new opportunities and we love them and we use them a lot, but they also create challenges to our democracy and to a level playing field for companies, for product safety, uh, etc. for so many things. So I think that it is important that we regulate and that we decide the rule book for the platforms. Uh, of course, uh, we always listen to uh, concerns and we always try to find the best way to do it so it's not a bureaucratic uh, hell uh, we need to, to find we need to find the best solutions uh, but I also think that that is what we're doing but we also have a right to discuss business models whether they are doing something good for society or not and therefore I, I think that we will keep on discussing business models uh, here in in the parliament we will discuss 
algorithms we will discuss must carry obligations for platforms. We are not just talking about Facebook, we are talking about all uh, platforms uh, and digital uh, services. Uh, I, I think that we can do uh, things, uh, we can take back control, uh, so we decide the development, we can give users more rights towards the platforms they have become, many of them at least, public spaces, therefore we have, uh, and they have an obligation also to act in that way. However, and let me say this as the last remark, I recognize that it is difficult. This is, is, this is really tricky because at one side we want the platforms to make sure that their algorithms are not uh, amplified, uh, they are not am amplifying misinformation, disinformation. Uh, we want it to be a trustworthy place to be for men and women, etc. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we don't want them to narrow down, to regulate, to monitor, to uh, make content moderation too much in a way that kind of narrow down uh, the freedom of speech. And this is difficult, so I, I also recognize that there are some balances here we need to find, uh, and it's not, uh, it's not easy. But I think what is important is that we set up the rule book and we say that what is illegal offline should also be illegal online. So that we make that, there should be no dis distinction between offline and online world. And with this, I hope that we can do a lot of things. But we are still in the early phase of the work with the DSA. Uh, we, have amend we have deadlines for tabling amendments tomorrow. Uh, and uh, in the autumn, uh, I will try to negotiate with all colleagues and all the committees uh, that has a, a responsibility on the DSA. And then I hope that we, during the French presidency, will be able to finalize uh, uh, the DSA proposal. And, and then it will hopefully have uh, an impact very, very fast, fast so we can make sure that we have a safe and trustworthy online environment uh, and then we, that we can use uh, all the benefits uh, from, from the platforms uh, without being afraid of uh, the consequences for democracy. Thank you so much. Perfetto, grazie. Crystal. That's great. Thank you, Crystal. I think the comment what's online can't be the Wild West. What's online can't escape from the rules. The rules have to be followed by everybody. That's got to be the thread running through all of this, I think. Because where people break the law, we need to be able to respond more speedily. And we need to work so as further to strengthen civil society's ability to enjoy support to grow a positive atmosphere and help bring about a proper effective ecosystem which of course means that the institutions have a role to play. Yeah, license that's asked for the floor again. I'll get the floor, but please just one minute, Yale, because we still have another panel to get through, and we'll be able to see each other again in the future that is very committed to this issue. But Yale. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I just want to clarify one statement. You asked about whether they sell data of their users, and I just want to clarify and in response to Ara's response. They perhaps don't sell data directly, but what they do is sell targeting tools to advertisers, and you are able to target people based on the data they collect from you. And I think the most telling, most recent example of why this is troublesome is look at the Global Witness Report about what happened with their advertising in Northern Ireland just this past week. They put forth a campaign to target people based on whether they were Catholic or Protestant, based on which side of the street they were on. And they showed images of burning cars and called on people to turn to the streets in Northern Ireland. And Facebook approved those political ads. So I just want to clarify, while they may not directly sell our data, that talking point is actually meant to not let us fully understand that they use our data to sell targeting tools to advertisers. Thank you so much. Bene, ringrazio per questa ulteriore. Thank you for that clarification. It just shows both how complex, as Krista was saying, this whole thing is, and it means that we can now 
move forward to panel two. Loshmanitz Shiboshevich is going to be running this one. I'll give him the floor. We've also got the shadow rapporteur from our group, Andrea Shida, who will have something, I'm sure, to say as part of this. But like, Vladimir, have go, have the floor, sir. Thank you, Pier, Pier Francesco. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me thank, uh, especially our guests for Lodi. Yes. Okay. Now we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just uh, wanted to thank our uh, participants, par guests, participants of this panel for accepting our invitation. Uh, the discussion uh, in the first panel, uh, which we could uh, listen to, uh, was exciting. I believe that we will uh, more or less continue uh, continue it. Let me very briefly introduce uh, panelists. Uh, uh, we have today with us uh, Madame Helle Torning Schmidt. Uh, Madame Torning Schmidt is co chair of uh, an institution called uh, Oversight Board. It is a kind of appellate uh, body created by Facebook, um, and uh, uh, it is responsible for checking the Facebook decisions uh, to remove. Uh, uh, somebody's content, somebody's posts, if those uh, people uh, complain. Uh, I understand that uh, uh, this is an independent body, however, it is financed by Facebook. It would be great uh, to hear something about uh, the, uh, the experience, practical experience uh, of, this, uh, of this institution. Uh, however, let me uh, put attention of all of us to the fact that uh, quite recently, a couple of weeks ago, the body uh, supported the Facebook uh, decision on banning former President Donald um, uh, Trump. Uh, Madame Toning Schmidt uh, uh, was Prime Minister of Denmark, uh, leader of the Social Democratic, uh, Democratic Party, and also was a member of the European Parliament. A uh, uh, second lady, uh, Madame Sarah Andrew, uh, is a legal director of the uh, anti-disinformation project uh, uh, of the organization, non-profit uh, NGO called AVAS. Uh, this organization uh, promotes uh, activity, uh, public activity in various areas, including human rights, animal rights, climate change, and so on and so on. But also it has been focused on the problem of uh, disinformation. As uh, I was informed, uh, Avas has published 16 reports on disinformation. It's interesting that eight of them were on Facebook, one of on YouTube, one of uh, WhatsApp. I understand they were probably not praising those uh, those platforms. Uh, and uh, the third uh, uh, the third uh, panelist speaker is our colleague Andreas Schieder, uh, who is, as uh, Francesco already said. Uh, uh, shadow uh, uh, reporter, as the shadow reporter on the uh, Inge report. Let me just say uh, some words uh, at the very beginning uh, before I give the floor to, to the panelists. Uh, uh, internet, of course, uh, yes, every uh, man made tool can be used uh, for good, positive purposes and, uh, and sinister ones. So, as we all have noticed, especially in the last couple of years, uh, uh, this uh, uh, very valuable uh, tool, very, va very valuable instrument that serves all of us uh, on everyday basis uh, uh, is being used also for uh, malicious purposes, uh, including disruption of the democratic order uh, in uh, our countries, in open societies, uh, destabilizing political situation there, and uh, promoting uh, alleged effectiveness of auto autocratic regimes. Uh, uh, at the beginning of the term of this term of the parliament, uh, the SND initiative to uh, create a special committee responsible for studying the, the problem of disinformation was not shared by the majority of MEPs. But after a kind of second thought, uh, uh, it got uh, uh, strong enough support. Uh, uh, and Inge uh, committee has been established uh, in a couple of. Uh, 
uh, months uh, from now, we will have to not only to present uh, the effects of our studies, but also our recommendations. So uh, the, uh, that kind of discussions as, as uh, today one uh, are of uh, special importance because uh, uh, your expertise can help us to uh, define uh, wise, proper uh, recommendations. Uh, I understand as a lawyer that uh, Probably some additional regulations uh, of uh, platform activities, uh, the, the way platform uh, do act, uh, uh, are are needed. I understand that uh, uh, Madame uh, Toning Schmidt uh, has been a little bit reluctant, uh, being afraid that uh, any further regulations uh, may create a risk for freedom of speech. Uh, uh, it's my deep conviction that the vast major, at least vast majority, if not all of the members of the INGE uh, are uh, uh, very cautious and uh, uh, nobody wants to damage uh, democracy and democratic uh, freedoms. Uh, however, uh, sometimes I get a feeling that uh, we have to deal with, uh, with the situation similar to what is being called a square wheel, yeah, because uh, uh, we have to defend democracy, we have to defend our freedoms, we have to, to defend our rights, uh, uh, and how to do that uh, effectively, uh, uh, since uh, uh, the present uh, uh, reactions are not very much satisfying. Uh, it was very interesting to listen to uh, uh, two uh, employees, one former, one, one present uh, of, of Facebook, and uh, listen to Yael uh, describing some situations, some cases, uh, from her own ex personal experience, when there was no reaction by the uh, uh, by the uh, Facebook uh, officials, authorities to some uh, uh, alerts, uh, and um, uh, listening to uh, Madame Orasala declaring that uh, Facebook is uh, ready to change. Uh, so, how far and which way Facebook and other platforms are ready to change and to cooperate with regulators? Uh, European Parliament is one of uh, such regulators. I understand that uh, it is uh, much better uh, for various reasons if uh, international institutions like European Union are dealing with the issue than uh, that it is being done by individual governments, by individual countries. I understand that it would be great if the United Nations could uh, pay, uh, play such a role, but uh, Knowing very well this organization, I'm a little bit skeptical if this is uh, uh, able to do that. Uh, I understand uh, reading about some recommendations by Avas that uh, uh, Ms. Sarah Andrew uh, recommends uh, also to the parliament uh, uh, to make uh, all those uh, 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 platform activities more transparent. Uh, that uh, people, users, internet users, deserve to be well, properly informed, uh, especially when, uh, uh, after fact-checking, it's known that some messages, some posts uh, uh, are false. Uh, is it, uh, in your opinion, sufficient way to, to tackle the problem? Uh, and my final uh, remark is that uh, we usually, in Inge Committee, we focus on malicious activities and, and their perpetrators. And then, while thinking how to defend ourselves, we think, for instance, about educating people, uh, informing them, and so on. But what to do, this is an embarrassing question to me, what to do if uh, even common sense people uh, believe in absurdic uh, conspiracy theories, uh, when you can get the feeling that information, education means nothing if they just want to believe. And uh, uh, considering uh, last American experiences, uh, we, we, we see how dangerous it can, uh, can become. So now I would like to give the floor uh, to uh, our panelists. Uh, first uh, to uh, Madame uh, Torning Schmidt. Uh, then Madame Sarah Andrew, and then finally uh, my colleague uh, Andres Schiedel. Please. Mrs. Turning, could you press the speak button, please? Thank you. 
Hi there. Uh, sorry, uh, this is a new system to me. It's absolutely great to be with you all uh, on such an important topic. Uh, obviously, I was introduced as a former colleague of, of you all, uh, and that makes it even more obvious for me to accept this invitation on such an important uh, discussion. Uh, first, a few words about my personal views on, on social media, uh, just to declare where I'm coming from. I believe that social media has um, enhanced our uh, democracy in so many corners of the world, uh, have made it possible for many of us to connect with each other in movements. Uh, some opposition groups in authoritarian regimes would never exist without social media. Uh, we have the whole Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter, and other movements that would not be able to come together without social media. And then we also have the personal advantages that we've seen uh, in the pandemic. But it's also very obvious that uh, so social media also has a, a clear downside, and many of you have discussed that today, and I think we have to be extremely uh, open and frank about uh, that. Uh, and some of that responsibility is borne by the social media companies themselves. Uh, Facebook, for example, took a long time to realize that they had a duty of care, uh, also of changing some of their behaviors. And I guess up to 2016, uh, Facebook had not completely understood uh, how big, uh, what, what a big responsibility they had uh, also in terms of uh, combating uh, misinformation, uh, combating hate speech and other uh, negative uh, what were other negative t things that happens on social media? Um, so when Facebook asked me to be part of this oversight board, I of course looked at the history of Facebook and discussed with myself uh, and others uh, how this oversight board could help uh, regulating content on social media platforms, uh, which is Facebook and Instagram. Uh, and I believe very, very strongly that this is a very positive step in the right direction. Why is that? Uh, until now, it has been very obvious that uh, social content on social media has has ultimately been regulated uh, by a few executives in Silicon Valley, and ultimately has been up to Mark Zuckerberg and the most difficult content decisions uh, to take the final decisions. With the oversight board, that has finally ended because the oversight is not only independent. Uh, we're not paid by Facebook, as was mentioned earlier. We're paid by an independent trust where Facebook has put uh, a lot of money into an independent trust. But for example, Facebook can't remove me from my post. I can say exactly what I want to about Facebook, which I also uh, do from time to time. Uh, so we are independent. But the other thing that attracted me to this way of uh, moderating content is, of course, that Facebook has uh, committed themselves to following not only our decisions on the individual cases that we pick, uh, but also following our recommendations, which are policy recommendations. So for the first time in history, we actually have an independent body moderating content uh, on uh, social media platforms. And I always say that uh, there's the best solution to this, and I say, think that was said early on as well, the best solution to this would, would obviously be if the UN or another big multilateral organization had created uh, this kind of content uh, moderation, uh, independent content moderation. Uh, that has not been possible. So for me to, for, for the platforms to create it themselves, but actually create us in a, uh, create a, an oversight board, which is truly independent, uh, is the second best solution. Uh, and I want to put a little bit of a, an argument in here today that regulation and legislation cannot do everything. Uh, but also I want to put in that we are not a substitute for regulation or legislation. I know the European Parliament uh, well enough. I certainly know Christel Scheldemus well enough to know that, of course, she will look into this and the European Parliament will look to, into this with the utmost con uh, consideration for getting the balances just right. Uh, and I would actually suggest to you today uh, that a self-regulatory -regula approach has a lot of value. Uh, this is something that is used in many uh, countries where we have a self where we have uh, press self-regulation. I know it obviously best from our own country, Denmark, where we have press uh, uh, but you also have that in many European countries where the press is actually self-regulating uh, within, of course, the limits of uh, legislation. And that's what I'm hoping that in, in, in social media, we can copy a little bit what we have 
from uh, from the the national uh, uh, self-regulation, but do it at a, at a global scale. And that is why, of course, we need regulation of these big social media platforms. But uh, we also have to be very, very careful that we don't over-regulate because, as we can see in, in countries like Russia, Belarus, uh, Hong Kong, to a certain extent, um, many, many countries, they are so keen to regulate social media, and we all know why. That's because they want to um, oppress uh, free speech. They want to oppress uh, uh, opposition uh, groups, and we are seeing that every day that uh, author authoritarian regimes uh, are pushing social media uh, and are trying to push self-regulation away and trying to regulate obviously to stifle uh, free uh, freedom of uh, speech so i do think we have to be very very careful and find these balances and the reason why i have gone into this as a, as a true democrat but also critical towards social media of course is that i very strongly believe that this is a such such a such special platform that that uh, regulators also have to accept uh, a special way of regulating this and perhaps that could be a mixture of regulation Yes, and legislation, but also self-regulation, and that's what the oversight board is uh, is part of of doing. I think we're already seeing the some of the results of our work. We are seeing a very clear uh, policy recommendation coming out of the oversight board on the Trump case, uh, which has already created changes uh, in Facebook, uh, where where, for example, they are removing this. Um, uh, newsworthiness criteria that they have used for uh, politicians. They will no longer use that for politicians. We also, also see more transparency uh, towards users. And we also, because we have criticized uh, some of their content moderation, uh, we're also seeing that that has a spillover towards uh, perhaps creating more focus on human moderation, but also uh, looking into their algorithms and their uh, automated content moderation uh, to find out whether that can be more in line with their human rights uh, obligations. So I'm, I think even though we're only one year into our work, we will be seeing uh, more transparency, uh, more people being able to access these uh, decisions and understanding these decisions. And ultimately, we will also see social media companies treat their users better than they are now. We are hearing so many uh, stories about how users are not being treated very well, and I'm sure that the Oversight Board will push Facebook to treat their users much, much better than they do now. So this was my introduction. I hope you have questions for me. I'm very sorry to say that I have to leave at five o'clock um, European Central Time, so, um, so hopefully if you have questions, uh, shoot away. I'm so excited to be here and also answer any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you so much. We'll try to end in time. Now, uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, Madam Andrew. I see that uh, Madam Orasala would like also uh, to say something, but after panelists, uh, okay? Uh, Madam Andrew, floor is yours. Mrs. Andrew, could you press the speak button, please? Thank you. Yes, thank you. And I'm hoping that we will have our presentation on screen in just a moment. If that's available. So whilst the presentation is hopefully being sourced, um, thank you so much. There we go. I wanted to thank very much uh, the organisers uh, and the S&D group for our invitation to speak today. Uh, we're really, really glad to be here. Um, this panel was asked to look at measures to strengthen the spaces of democracy. And it's been a long afternoon, so I just want you to sort of take a seat back and I want you to imagine that the space that we're in, this is a, a digital space where we're physically knocking on doors with leaflets and live political speeches on, on street corners have all been replaced by posts and blogs shared by your family and by politi political ads targeted at you that arrive magically in your newsfeed on just the subject you were tweeting your friend about yesterday. But that digital space that we're living in, our digital town square, if you like, has become polluted with disinformation to a level that's endangering democracy, tolerance and trust in science. And we at Avaz want to treat this um, phenomenon like pollution. We want to have the ambition to reach for a Paris agreement on disinformation. That means 
the whole kit and caboodle, setting key performance indicators, monitoring disinformation, and then regulating to stop the practices of the industry that are accelerating uh, the pollution through our digital ecosphere. So moving on to slide two, please. What does this disinformation look like? Well, we've been working in this area for some time. Um, as was mentioned, we have produced numerous reports. We first started working on this phenomenon in uh, late 2018, and this is a report from 2019, just ahead of the EU elections, where we looked at the disinformation that was being spread and organized by networks of far-right um, political activists. This was disinformation intended to specifically attack the uh, EU Commission's policies on immigration with uh, false information, alleging in many different languages and using different pictures, but with very similar memes, that migrants were responsible for the rape of EU citizens. This is really nasty, offensive, hateful and divisive content, but we were advised it's just on the side of legal. And therefore, this would be precisely the kind of content that we're talking about that would fall outside of the um, illegal measures, that uh, illegal content that are going to be dealt with under the, uh, um, uh, the e-commerce directive replacement measures of the DSA. It's the legal but harmful content that we feel needs to be addressed by the Digital Services Act. If we can move to slide three. This is an example of voter suppression. This one actually comes from our work in ahead of the US 2020 elections last year. And these statistics are from a poll of over 2,000 voters in swing states. You'll see 85% of, uh, of registered voters saw it, and 41% of those who saw it believed it was true. And if you think that's a phenomenon that's uh, restricted to the US, I'm afraid it's not. A highly respected European fact-checking organization, Corrective, found exactly the same kind of allegations of voter fraud in the recent German election elections in, in um, Saxony-Anhalt. Um, I can provide links to all of this afterwards. I realise I'm rushing through somewhat, but we have a lot of material to cover. And for slide four, please. To bring us right up to date, we have been looking at disinformation intended to undermine trust in EU health institutions and the public health measures that we're all having to employ to combat COVID-19. We saw this particular viral video reached over 7 million views in seven different languages across Europe. And... Um, it formed part of a, a, a report that we will be releasing uh, later this month. Um, if we can turn to slide five, I want to move us through to the kind of arms that we're seeing the platforms bring to use in this fight. What kind of mitigation measures might we expect to see deployed under the Digital Services Act? Slide six, please. So at the moment, I'm sorry I'm going so fast. Um, do I can take questions afterwards. Um, the actions that are most visible to users include removals and labelling. And you can see here that the platforms are taking very, very different approaches to COVID disinformation, with Facebook in the main preferring labelling and moving to Twitter and YouTube who favour, at least in the data in our sample, removals. Slide seven, please. But I'm afraid that this is not... Um, an indication that all is fixed on Facebook. As you can see here, when we then look at the amount of content that's left on the platform unactioned, you can see that Facebook still have 27% of the content that we found unactioned. But we have to say that YouTube are the clear and, and outstanding winners in this rather unsavory um, award ceremony with 92% of the disinformation that was on their platform unactioned. And I just want to take a beat here to say, this is not a VAS claiming this is disinformation. All of the disinformation that we included in this, in this research, in fact, in all of our research, has been confirmed as either false or partly false by the uh, reputable fact checkers with whom the platforms have relationships. It's not a vow saying it's disinformation, it's disinformation that platforms really ought to know. And the value of correcting this, this, this disinformation, of, of, of changing, of, 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 of correcting this disinformation, I just want to pick up on, on that point that um, we were asked uh, in the introduction by, by Mr. Cimo Cevice, I hope I got that right, um, is that Avaz loves its science. And 
It's absolutely demonstrated from years of peer-reviewed research that corrections work, that corrections are in a form, if, if you like, of media literacy in themselves. They correct the immediate disinformation, they inform the viewer that they've been served disinformation, so they begin to have an understanding of the environment that they're in, and it also helps them understand who's serving them this disinformation. Never mind that it should also be informing the algorithm of whether or not it should promote the content. Correction of disinformation labeling is actually part of media literacy as well as a direct tool that can be used against the problem. But I'm afraid, as you can see, it's not necessarily happening. And if we move on to the next slide very briefly, that just gives you an overview of the amount of unactioned content that the um, users are encountering. I'm going to move rapidly on, if you don't mind, because we have a lot of information to cover. So um, I'd like to move on actually to the question of slide nine, which is around consistency of action on languages. Um, that's perfect, thank you. Um, it's just that, you know, given that we are dealing with uh, um, a global platforms addressing the European institution, it should be of paramount importance that they understand the market that they're in and they do not favor one market above another. But that's not what we're seeing here. What we're seeing here is that basically if you speak Spanish, German or English, you're pretty well served. If you're speaking French, well, you know, it's getting difficult with nearly um, half of the content you're likely to, the, half of the content that you're seeing um, not having any form of labeling or removal. But if you're Italian, and this is aggregated data, by the way, across the action taken by all the platforms in our study, you are, like, you are more likely to be seeing disinformation than not i.e. 84% of the disinformation which the platform's own fact checkers have already said is disinformation remains unactioned on the platforms. And moving through to slide 10, and this is with deference to uh, Ms. Thorning Schmidt's um, oversight board um, with whose decision on Trump, I, I did have the greater sympathy by the way. We do need to talk about the transparency with which these moderation decisions are taken. We like to call it the Hunter Biden effect because we found this particular one when we were in the, working on the US elections. But Facebook downranked this particular story. You might think that's a good thing. It's certainly not true. But they did it before it was fact checked. They said, if we have signals that a piece of content is false, we temporarily reduce its distribution pending review. Now, that gives us no idea of what the signals are, no idea of why they did it. And this is precisely the transparency and the lack of transparency that we are concerned about. In fact, you'll hear me say this again later, we think this is one of the biggest threats to free speech, and this panel was asked to consider free speech, that regulation which brings open, accountable decision-making and rights of appeal against platform decisions is vastly preferable to what's happening right now, which is, unless the Oversight Board take a look, these decisions are being taken in their multitudes daily on the platforms, in the private rooms of Facebook. Effectively, it's the privatization of our speech in the, in the town square that I asked you to imagine earlier. So moving on to slide 12, please. And just to reiterate, this is how we see preserving freedom of speech. We think that basically the DSA should be there to reinforce user empowerment, which we think includes labelling and correcting, with no removal of legal but harmful content and massively increased transparency over the decisions they take. So I'd next like to move on to kind of a little bit of the story that we were hearing being told in the panel just ahead about you know, what, whether or not the platforms are or are not um, part of the system that's recommending disinformation. And I thought it was very interesting that we had that debate. So I'd just like to tell you the story that we found, if we can move on. So we undertook a little bit of um, um, research in our recent COVID study on what happened if we liked a couple of anti-vax pages. Say you're at home and there's an interesting meme or a bit of fun, you may not even realize it's a particularly rabidly anti-vax page when you click on like it. What do you get served? Do you just get served the post that came up next from your aunt or uncle about their pet dog? No, 
You know, we found that if we clicked or liked any of those anti-vax posts, we got served anti-vax content. You can see 107 pages posting anti-vax content or featuring a well-known anti-vaxxer. And on the next slide, we can see that those anti-vaxxers included the Children's Health Defense for Europe, which despite its name, is actually founded by prominent US anti-vaxxer Robert F. Kennedy. And on the next slide, if you continue down that particular rabbit hole, you can give money to anti-vaxxers on Facebook. Here we have a birthday fundraiser for the Informed Consent Action Network, which is actually run by one Dell Bigtree, who a fellow NGO, the Center for Countering Digital Hate, has identified as one of the biggest uh, purveyors of anti-vax information across the internet. So just moving on to the last slide um, of this section, um, I want to give a few thoughts about um, regulation, and I apologise if I'm slipping slightly over my time. I promise I'll take less on the on the question section if I need to. But um, I know the meme of this conference has been about regulation, not guidelines. Um, but with huge respect, and I think echoing some of the speakers, we think it's probably we, that we need both. We think the Commission's recent guidance on the code of practice is a big step forward, but only if it's followed. If we allow the platforms to slip away over summer and produce another code of practice that does not reflect the ambition of the guidance, then we risk a poor code of practice, possibly being encoded as a code of conduct under the DSA. We really think we need rigour in both. I'm, I'm not going to digress any further because of time, but I can put in the chat a link to our position paper on the code of practice, where you can see our main asks and uh, commitments, for example, to reduce the spread of disinformation with measurement KPIs and safe design. But I'm going to turn back to the backbone that we have here, which is the Digital Services Act. So the Digital Services Act, we really, really applauded Michelle de Moses' report on it. There was a lot in there we felt was good. So if I only move on to the thing, the extra things I want, please forgive me. But, but we're really hoping that her report is accepted. But we were concerned that some aspects weren't quite fully dealt with. And perhaps the biggest concern was it appeared that they didn't deal with the DSA's current intention to restrict the assessment of the harms to intentional manipulation of the services. I really hope that some of the data that I've shared with you today shows that the risks are not simply about bad actors running rife, but are also inherent within the design of the platforms themselves. And therefore, risk assessment and mitigation processes simply must take the full view of human rights on the impacts of their algorithms, and that includes the right to life. If you are spreading disinformation on COVID-19, you are affecting the right to life. And they must make, take measures to prevent disproportionate acceleration of disinformation. We think those measures must include the redesign of platform algorithms. And of course, we need to see and have access to the variables and data sets that they're doing that with. If we can't check how they're doing it, how do we check what they're doing is happening? And we just end up with the same old backwards and forwards of we're not using engagement measures, but here's all the disinformation and here's how it gets to you. I mean, we, we need to get out of this transparent here's the factual situation and here's the argument and we need to get the data so we can actually work out what's going on. And that mentioning of data, I just want to confirm that we do, we do agree with the um, concept about um, transparency to users that um, on data use and choice over the platform's algorithms that Michelle de Moses' report included. But we'd just like to include another shout out for transparency to users over the decisions taken on the content. So going back to that idea of correcting, labeling and notifying users about the harms they've come to. So in short, we don't think it's one, we don't think it's guidelines, we don't think it's just regulation, we think it's both. And I shall leave it there to give room to the floor, um, but I'm happy to come back to any of that um, in the questioning session. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, next speaker is uh, Andrea Schiller, but I have a request to, to you, Andrea, since uh, uh, Madam Turning Schmidt is going to leave us in four minutes. Let me just ask her one one question, and uh, immediately after that, I will give you the floor. Uh, you have said uh, that uh, uh, self-regulation is a very variable method, but uh, so far many of us are not uh, very convinced, or many uh, are not very satisfied. Can you give us any example of what kind of further self-regulation? you have uh, on your mind. Uh, sure. Uh, 
My biggest worry when we talk about regulating social media platforms is that each country will try to push harsh legislation on social media platforms in order to stifle free speech. Uh, I love the European Union, and I think that if we came together, uh, we could actually do some regulation that could be meaningful. But let's not forget that half of the world's population lives live in countries that are not democratic. Uh, and I'm seeing so many authoritarian regimes that are really eager to regulate social media with legislation. So that is why we need to have a global approach to this. So my suggestion would be to look very, very carefully at, a, at an institution like the Oversight Board, look very carefully at what we're doing. And of course, I'm, I'm available, we're available to discuss this more because perhaps it is the right balance if we find a regulate, uh, if I have regulation, of course we have laws still and Facebook and social media platforms have to abide by the, the laws that we have, uh, which they already do, of course. Um, but we, in terms of specific content moderation, I think there's much more space for self-regulation uh, rather than having legislators do going into this. And I just want you to, to look at our web, website and see which, which decisions we have taken already. For the Trump case, for example, I don't know how legislate, legislation would have done that. And that you will always have to turn to some kind of self-regulation in that area. And if it's not the social companies doing it themselves, perhaps we should have global oversight boards doing this regulation for them because legislators are not very well positioned to do it. The companies are not very well positioned to do it. And that's why a middle form of the self-regulation in a global form would be, I, I believe, the best way of, uh, of doing it. Uh, and this is an experiment. We won't get it right. We're actually quite humble about how we are going about our business. But I think all the issues that have been raised until now on uh, content moderation, uh, pushing Facebook to be more transparent towards their users be, uh, in terms of their algorithms, all these things, those things can actually be achieved uh, by the oversight board that we have now and self-regulation in general. I hope that answers the question. I'm terribly sorry I have to leave, but I have another meeting starting yeah, at thank five. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Andreas Schieder, floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you and good afternoon from, from my side. Uh, as was said before, I also have to com commit that I love social media and that I think social media is quite useful for a lot of things, for your private life, but also for political uh, communication. But we have to see we have a big problem here. It is because democracy and uh, politics is about is a competition of ideas and concepts but it's also a competition about attention. And there, of course, we have already the conflict with entertainment and uh, cartoons and fun stuff. But also at the, what we see is now we have the competition of fake news and uh, wrong information and all these campaigns. What we also see is that the enemies of the freedom of speech misuse the freedom of speech to spread their false information. So therefore, I'm also not sure if the arguments which had been said before on that there is also not only free countries and therefore social media is good, that this is 100% true. But with what we see in the European Union and also in the US is that uh, social media are the gate sometimes also for uh, uh, the enemies of freedom of speech to do their uh, wrong information. Uh, I also think uh, sometimes what we see in the, mar in the marketing society, but also in, in other issues, is that platforms know sometimes more about your, you than we know about ourselves. Uh, and this, of course, is scaring because usually this is the role only for your psychotherapist and not for the social media. Uh, so when you are interested in bicycling, you get a lot of bicycling in advertisement, and, and this and this now is linked also with the with the fake news uh, uh, situation. What we also see there is strong business models behind. So what we need is level playing field, and I would say. I would identify five points. The one is the design of algorithm shapes the conversation. So therefore we need to have some public 
possibility of reform of algorithm. It must be, must be possible to investigate how those are calibrated and how those are designed. Secondly, we need responsibility for the content. Business model gears towards conflict. So therefore, where is more conflict, where is even more weird conspiracy, there is more clicks. And this, of course, it has an extremely negative uh, impact. Third, Online advert advertising shows simply the biggest pockets gets the loudest, loudest voice. Uh, so what we also see is that there, of course, is, is, is a negative impact on this. And social media companies, we have to see also something like real media companies. So therefore, we have also to discuss what also Helen Tonic schmidt was uh, saying, that we have to maybe apply a lot of rules which are for media companies, also for social media companies. And fifth, uh, there is a high market uh, concentration. We know since uh, 2007, since uh, Google was buying its uh, advertising uh, company, which was named DoubleClick, uh, they have now extremely control over the market. It is uh, five companies uh, having 79% of the control of the uh, 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 advertising market in the social media world. So what we see is market concentration is a risk for diversified media and for free speech. So also we have, of, of course, to discuss if our company rule and uh, all these things should also apply in the future for this big uh, market concentration which we see. Th thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, since we are already over time, I would like to ask just one question to Madam Andrew. You said uh, corrections work, but as I as I know, as I understand, uh, they work only in uh, half of the cases, approximately 50% or less. The optimist uh, would comment it that that's great. The pessimist uh, would say probably that it is not enough. Uh, do you have an idea uh, why only in 50%. Is it the problem of users, receivers of correction information, they do not understand it, or it is uh, the problem of the quality of correction, the way it is being done? And uh, why some platforms uh, uh, react uh, to false information uh, reluctantly and uh, why some other uh, do it more frequently? Do you have any explanation to that? Thank you. Hello, yes, I mean, I'm afraid I really can't speak as to what is in the um, minds of the platforms when they decide that they are not going to uh, participate in a fact-checking program or work with fact-checkers or produce simple, comprehensible ways of labelling uh, disinformation. We're particularly disappointed that no movement has been taken so far on retroactive notifications. We've undertaken studies in which we have shown delays of up to 28 days in between the information being, um, uh, disinformation first being posted and then corrected on um, a fact-checking platform. And one has to remember that that 28 days is a kind of rather crucial period because the height of activity and interaction with that content will be in its early life on the platform. If you correct, correct it 28 days later, then there are going to be huge swathes of people who never actually get to see the correction. So I think that's one area that could be looked at, the investment in the... Um, access to independently verified check, fact-checked information and I think that investment should be a responsibility across all the platforms and not, I think Facebook at the moment are the only ones with a developed relationship with fact-checkers, I think we should see that extended. I think in terms of the 50%, I'm afraid I don't know the study that you've uh, undertaken. We have undertaken our own study. And we also um, were part of a sign-up letter that was organised around an internationally organised peer review of the value of corrections. Um, and um, that indicated that actually overwhelmingly the backfire effect uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't a reality. Um, so I'm, I, can't, I can't comment specifically um, on that, I'm afraid. And uh, the, the final question you asked about why platforms take, 
different um, different approaches. I, I think we do understand at Avaz that the platforms are best placed to understand what the best way to communicate with their their viewers are. But what we don't accept is that the best way to communicate is either to do nothing or to do something secretively. These are communications networks. And just like newspapers publish corrections in the old days that are available to anyone who buys the newspaper, we think that that whole activity needs to be brought out, brought out into the light. I'm hoping that answers some of your, your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Andrew, very much. I understand that we are uh, uh, coming to, to, to end our uh, conference. Uh, let me express my uh, deep appreciation of the quality, for the quality of uh, that uh, debate uh, for all of us, members of INGA. Uh, it has uh, given us a lot of uh, uh, food for thought. Uh, and uh, of course, we will have in, in our memory, in our minds, uh, uh, the interventions by our guests. Uh, so thank uh, everybody who attended this conference as active uh, participants, as uh, those who listened, uh, watched uh, the discussion. And uh, I don't know if that is my role or you, Pirfa uh, Francesca, are going to, to say that the, the conference is, uh, is ended. <laughs>